This is episode 93 of our Road to Unicum, and today we review the Udez 1516. This is the tier 10 new Swedish medium tank in World of Tanks. Now, in the prior episode, I reviewed the tier 8 Udez 14.5, and I was gonna review the tier 9 first, and I can still review that tank after this episode if you guys want to see it. Uh, but I was really excited to capture a few of my early battles in the tier 10 tank that show different usage for this tank. And you can see I'm clearly not paying attention to where I'm going. I just drove into some building. It's funny, in a lighter tank, you don't want to do that because that will actually affect your momentum. And some like the heavier tanks, like the heavies, they'll just roll right through it. But as you can see, as I was discussing in chat at the beginning, you know, in the countdown, there is no arty in this battle. So I have the option of doing something and really kind of trying out the hydraulic suspension on this tank. So when you're driving at speed, the gun depression is right around 6%, so not particularly good. However, if you are driving below 20 kilometers per hour, this is true of all the tier 8 to 10 Swedish mediums, you can increase that max gun depression to minus 13 degrees, which is exceptional. Now, as I talked about in my review of the tier 8 tank, it's not immediate gun depression. So you kind of need to work a little bit of a ridge carefully. And all you need to do to activate that gun depression is to just aim your turret low while you're slowed, slowed down or stationary. Okay, so what often happens here is you can see that some of their tanks like their VK and especially their T-57 got uh, backed down the hill. And it's really helpful to have at least one friendly tank destroyer over where our Waffentrager is over by D1 or alternatively down around the G4 area, right? And their T95, he has, you know, his instinct to push up and to brawl is good. The problem is, is that he's pushing too far forward and, you know, exposing his side. What I would do if I were in the T95 is either stop where their E75 is now or go over to the west where their T57 is over by uh, B2 basically so he can always forward face toward the enemy and you can see like you know right now I, I'm exposing more of my tank than I normally would right and our the T57 hits me once he's packing heat there so that's going to go right through the hole now keep in mind that AP and APCR uh, have a much greater tendency to uh, bounce heat less so because the way that the shells I'm no tank expert but the way the shells are designed it's not based on pure penetration but rather Okay, I, I'm going to say something and then you tank nuts are going to tell me I'm right. It's the liquefaction, that jet stream that goes and pierces the opponent's armor. It's not based so much on velocity um, of the shell itself, but rather what's inside of it. Okay, so you can see I got four shots onto the T95 there. And again, really not giving him all that much to aim at. I mean, I guess we're both aiming at each other's uh, cupolas. Now, i got to be careful. Remember, there's the Waffentrager in the back on their side over by A5. And if you're, you guys have seen me talking about this a lot in the last 10 episodes or so, uh, but what you want to do if you're sniping in the back before the battle begins, knock down as many trees as possible, form as wide and as deep hard cover as you can. And you notice I'm circling around here clockwise so that I can get to a point where I can fire on their T-57, uh, but hopefully not be in an area where I'm going to get fired on by their Waffentrager. And you notice we're, we're down three tanks. Now you can't really do anything about it when you're you know losing really badly and I'm chasing this T57 for the simple reason that he's clipping right and so unfortunately I push I'm a little bit too zealous and coming after the T57 and I, I really shouldn't have eaten that damage from the Yag Tiger you never know how long battle's gonna last and then I make a mistake here the Yag Tiger was was backing up or no that okay that was fine but I just there the Yag Tiger was backing up remember it's a non turreted tank a destroyer. Uh, it's going to heavily affect his aim, and I didn't think right there that he'd be able to get a shot. He sort of snapshot of that, and I got to pull in tight so this E57 doesn't have a shot. Now, one thing that I could have done if I knew that I had enough time is reverse side scrape, meaning pull out diagonally to the right, kind of as a clock facing, um, backing up toward the southeast. And you guys saw me talk about this. I made this mistake back in the prior battle toward the end in Overlord where what I should be doing is pulling out an angle so what the opponents see are my tracks first to try to bait them into a shot. And then that shot right there, a I, I, little bit unlucky certainly, that should have been, if the shot went anywhere in the kind of middle two thirds of the reticle, that would have gone through the side of the turret. And then here I'm taking, these are relatively um, tough shots, but I'm only like 
50 meters from this E75. And again, anything that hits him will kill him, but the reverse is also true. So I just want to make sure not to give him a good shot on me. Again, as soon as I fire, go ahead and back up here. And we have clawed our way back. We were behind by, you know, three tanks, but now, okay, you know, now we've obviously got the lead. That, by the way, uh, you might be wondering, it looked like I fired, or I did fire, when my aiming reticle hadn't yet gone down to the tank. Well, kind of what happens with a hydraulic suspension is kind of gradual, then it kicks in, and then the gun will drop quickly. I probably should have waited, you know, to be totally honest. I, I fired that just a split moment before I should have, and you know, our 50Bs are cleaning up. The great thing about the 50Bs, it's a really, in my opinion, a difficult tank to play. It's big as a whale. The turret is soft as butter. So anytime you're firing at an opponent, if they're loaded, they can fire back. And because of the large size, it's easy to hit from distance. And it has absolutely no camo. So it's a very, you know, it's a tank that used to be, I think, better regarded years ago. But, you know, in the current meta, or really in the last two to three years, it's gradually been power creeped by tanks that have bully armor. And generally speaking, autoloaders are harder to play than single shot tanks uh, for the simple reason that you need to kind of gauge when you can expose yourself especially in a tank like the 50b which again is a big soft blimp and you know we're not totally out of the woods here if i were the bat chat i would be moving back to somewhere like for example down on the k lane uh, or alternately trying to flex around the direction where i am because we're i'm one shotable and each of our 50bs i think is either one or two shotable uh, but you know that being said i don't want to be too passive because i have the better vision and camo and help spot so the striv um, you know, he's he made a mistake here. I mean, I think he just panicked and you know, he could have tried firing. Granted, the Striv TD when he is not in his uh, TD mode uh, has pretty poor gun depression, so maybe he wouldn't have been able to hit me anyway. Uh, but you know, there's a nice tracking shot and you know, he's pretty much done because he already burned his repair kit. Most players don't carry double repair kits. Some players do. I think the only time it's worth carrying double repair kit is if you are very confident that your tank is unlikely to get set on fire, right? So that can be true, for example, some of the really, really beefy heavy tanks where you can run dual repair kits and then a first aid kit. But for pretty much every tank that has that's reasonably penetratable, and that's true because the keep in mind the Swedish mediums from tier 8 to 10 have paper thin armor. They rely on slope to deflect and bounce shots, not thickness of armor. And as a consequence, for example, if you get blapped by arty or high explosive, you know, there's a pretty good chance you're going to get set on fire. And I think, obviously, I've, you've heard me talk about this before, too. I tend to attract a disproportionate uh, amount of fire because people either recognize the otter tag, um, they've got XVM installed, and they see me as a, you know, deep purple from, a w, from an account perspective, uh, or they just know who I am, or they're just shooting at me. But anyway, so what you're going to see me do here coming up, since I'm getting up here early now, I don't have the speed or comfort to go up to E7. Keep in mind, there are three arties. So the name of this game is not to get spotted early. Now, what I would have liked our T62 to do, uh, or our 907, is to go to E7 and spot their tanks as they are crossing the 7-8 lanes. Now, the problem with all of the Swedish mediums is the top speed is pretty limited. This guy has a limited top speed of around 50 to 55 kilometers per hour, and that's pretty meaningfully slow, right? Now, the thing is, all these tanks are on the other side of these ridges here, so while we have five of their tanks spotted, I don't have a shot on any of them. As it turns out here, it looks like neither team has actually gone to E7, or T62A, in my opinion, is misplaying this, because he's a tank with a terrific beefy turret and a low pancake profile, and better speed. So he could be playing more, kind of, he could be pushing up and spotting more than he is. Uh, so I can't really rely on him. I think at the beginning of the countdown, I'd asked one of our mediums if they could come up here. And I meant specifically the RU mediums, but neither, none of them are doing it. So I'm going to go ahead and move up here. And again, moving up behind the bush to make sure that, you know, it decreases the likelihood that I'm going to get spotted. And, you know, I'm rewarded by coming up here and I spot there 183, right, which is great. And he immediately gets fired upon and he's going to be kind of heading toward me a little bit. So I'm going to go ahead and blind fire here. But, you know, obviously I need to be careful if he is packing the Hesh. It's possible with a high roll that he could one-shot me, or at least just so badly cripple my tank, I'm, for all intents and purposes, going to be one-shot about the rest of the game. And at that point, you, your tactical options are terribly limited. And that's why I always talk about it's the hit points you want to preserve are not the hit points you have when you're one-shotable. It's the hit points you have when you're two-shotable. You know, if you're two-shotable, you can afford one mistake or one lucky penetration or, you know, one unlucky-for-you RNG shot right okay 
So our mouse has inexplicably gone middle. So if you guys heard me talk about this before, going middle early in a low vision, no camo, slow heavy tank is a complete waste of time. You don't want to play inside the 2-3 ridge line this early in the game. You can push that way certainly when the enemy thinned out, but the problem is is that mouse is going to get outspotted by any tank destroyer or medium that is, you know, sitting behind a bush, right? Even if they're not, assuming let's say 400 meters, the mouse is not going to outspot a medium. You know, the, the reverse is true. Now you can see here, part of the advantage of coming here, because I've been unwilling to give up uh, the mid, is the fact that I've spotted their T62 who pushed up. And the thing is, he, he may not have realized that I was here. There's no reason. I had not been spotted at that point, so he couldn't have known that he's moving into a mistake. But what he's put himself to, into is a tremendous crossing field of fire. And what's great here is just a little bit of a ridge here. I can expose very little of my tank while taking a shot and see the only shot that he had was just at the very front of my hull. And, you know, that's what you want to do. Just give as thin a slice as possible for them to shoot out while maximizing your ability to hopefully see as much of their hull as you need to be able to take a good shot. And then their T-62, because he's got pretty good speed, just manages to get back behind that little corner on the southern piece of the hill. Okay, now... We obviously can't really rely. The mouse could spot something if it's within three squares of him, you know, or four squares and it fires. Yeah, maybe that's even questionable to be honest. But um, what I would like to do is to figure out where their 183 is and their 62A. But I've got to be careful, obviously, because you know, as we've discussed before, most 183Bs are packing hash. I've actually I bought it during the black market thing. So I had no intention of ever playing uh, the British tank destroyers in the way they're currently designed because the Hesh is so broken. It's basically, oh, let me basically, it, it functions as basically high penetration, high explosive, where against a lot of tanks, you'll get the full penetration value, which is ridiculous. And then even if it doesn't penetrate, it's basically treated as high explosive. And when you have an alpha value with the round of like, I think it's 1650, um, you know, you have that, so that's what, 875, and then you subtract the actual armor. So you're still looking at, you know, even against heavy tanks of doing five to 600 damage when you fail to penetrate with the Hesh. I mean, it's such a, it's such a broken mechanic, and I wish, you know, I wish the game just didn't have shell types like that. They're, they're just so imbalancing, and they put so much pressure on customers to have to fire premium ammo and yes i know you can pay for that with credits but of course since those rounds typically cost three to twenty times more expensive than silver ammo it, it's basically a really subtle um, credit sink that will cause players to have to spend real money on the game to boost their in-game income and so that you know for many reasons the, the current implementation even though quote-unquote gold ammo is now premium ammo uh, it's it still really disproportionately favors players who are willing to dump money into the game okay so you may be wondering why i'm sitting here right um, and thank goodness our 183b heated my advice didn't stay where he was which is all the way down around uh, c8 or so because he's a blimp with terrible camo and he's terribly slow and he's got soft armor if he gets spotted in the open He's done. He's going to get shellacked by Artie and by their tanks with guns. Thankfully, he backs up. And you can see we've got a really deep TD line over in the A lane. And what a lot of people do is abandon the position, right? You know, people would say, join the Lemming train or back up, run away, whatever. And the thing to recognize is that I'm in a reasonably safe spot where I've got ninja levels of camo. And this is one of the things I want to talk about. Yes, this tank can certainly ridge brawl like I showed in the... Westfield battle, but the other thing that this tank is really good at doing is ninja spotting, right? It like I think my with my crew with camo, and I'm trying. I think I might have brothers in arms, or maybe not. This is only like a two and a half or three skill crew, um, but you're looking at like a 34% camo rating, which is exceptional for uh, for a medium tank, right? And so since I'm sitting stationary, I get the full value of that camo, and you can see that that's what I mean by I've got heavy protection behind me. I've got three hard-hitting TDs, and plus our RU medium, who I guess is just too beat up to do anything, but anything that I spot is essentially going to get obliterated. And the thing is, like, I'm going to wait and see if there are any of their tanks pushed up. Remember, when their Type 5 Heavy was spotted, he backed down immediately, right? Which, you know, obviously that means he has six cents. The other thing that he knows is, you know, one, our three RDs are going to, you know, poop all over him, but two, he knows he has to assume that those tank destroyers uh, that were firing earlier down the 8-9 lane are providing cover, right? And so if their tanks come, you know, down, you know, if their tanks continue to push north of the F line, E line, if they break that and go north, the only way that they can approach our tank destroyer back line would be to push down in uh, down by the coastline 
in the zero line. That's what I would do if I were in the Type 50 or the 50M. Uh, because of the way the ridges are positioned, you can get a little bit of arty cover. But the problem is, is they're not advancing, right? So they had brushed us off the eastern side of the map, right? But they're not doing anything with it, right? And if they just get, like a Type 5 has really, you know, a pretty good armor profile overall. So if he just uh, kept moving up the zero line, he would be spotting for their arties, right? And of course, he's a heavy tank, he's not a spotter, but because of the way that our tank destroyers had backed up, he could have moved close enough to be able to do so. And here's part of the value of controlling the mid, right? I can see where their tanks are, right? Obviously, their gorilla is bailing, and he's not stopping. Even though I'm spotted, notice he, I can tell he's not stopping to counterfire me, right? Which means that his mindset is to go sit somewhere in the southeastern corner of the map, right? And that's good. So our 907 has pushed up, which is good. If he's careful about just exposing his turret, as long as he doesn't get RD'd, he, he can stay alive. But unfortunately, uh, the T-62 picks him off. The 62A doesn't know that I'm coming. And what I love here is that our, or I guess Artie's complaining they think we're going to lose. They're not, they don't really understand what's going on the map. A lot of players don't. I see Artie players complain and suicide and do stupid things. They just don't understand what's going on. And so obviously, RT-92A, you may be thinking, oh, well, you know, he's complaining. about like, if he was watching the map, he should have ran at least five minutes ago to A3, A4, at the least, right, and sat in the bushes and the ridge back there. Um, but now he stayed all the way in A1 where he's essentially trapped. And so the great thing is, remember that 183 that I really encouraged to back up and to let me spot? Now he's coming forward, which is the perfect time because what we want to do is split the attention of the Type 5. Type 5 is focused on trying to get to me, right? And he's stunned because he's been hit by our arty, and our 183 finishes him off. Okay, we're still down two tanks. Obviously, that's not good. Uh, but, you know, we have cleared out the middle of the map. Or rather, you know, I can push safely to around the six-lane area, and I should be able to spot their tanks. Now, keep in mind, too, the JPE is big and slow, uh, poor gun handling. The 183s have, you know, partial turrets. They can rotate, you know, for an arc in front of them. It's actually fairly limited. I didn't realize how limited it was until I bought this off the black market and paid it, but it's they're, it's terrible for brawling around corners because you, you can't do it. And there's the beauty, really, of you know spotting tanks when they're exposed. When you have these ridiculous, uh, you know, tier 10 British tank destroyers uh, with hash. I mean, just boom, one shot gone, and they're already wow. Like they're 261, just panic. They had the lead. There was no reason for one of their arties to come up here. Just read the game flow, right? Now, I would not say that they are in a good position, but obviously, since our arty was spotted, the one who refused to move from A1, no map awareness and died. And then what's really nice, I'm going to back up here just, just to try to put those bushes between me and the gorilla, and I track him. Um, I do get spotted, but, you know, it looks like he burned his repair kit, which is good. You know, if he gets hit once or twice now, uh, what I need to wait is long enough so that I can be reasonably confident that I have been dropped um, from, so you can hear the the arty fire just fired behind me. Okay, JP's up on the hill above me. Um, I'm spotted now, but again, our FV4005 puts him down. And we're even here in terms of remaining numbers of tanks, but I am not only, I'm at full hit points, but I also have, you know, pretty good ninja camo mechanics, right? And so this is good. Going to go ahead and put another shot in that 183. Of course, I'm going to get spotted from doing so. And you can see their arties are aiming mid. Obviously, I represent the biggest threat to them right now. Our 183 really has kind of the choice. He can either push directly west along the EF lane, R183. Uh, the other thing that he decides to do is just push down the zero lane. And wow, that was scary. That was really, okay, so we know where their gorilla is, right? And the moment that we know where their gorilla is, our 183, his decision to push down to the south and then hopefully push west on the K line is totally validated. Now this 183 to some extent is frozen, right? If he tries to chase me, I'll just run away or I'll hide in the bush. I'll have the first spot advantage because he's got crappy camo and I've got terrific camo. And so to some extent, what I wanna do is just stay alive spot them if possible, but not risk getting one shot. As long as I'm alive, we're in pretty good position, right? And what I'm telling our FV4005, really what I want him to do is push over to A1 and then cut directly south through the bush line and behind the ridges so that he can come and get flanking fire on their 183, possibly their gorilla, depending on where their gorilla goes. But I, a long time ago, their gorilla ran away southwest. Remember when I spotted him when I was over by the, you know, F7 area? And so, you know, a player doing that usually is signaling that they're going to be deep camping, right? So, you know, really, and the thing about their gorilla, too, is, you know, they're, 
Okay, that, there's our. Oh, by the way, our already did a really good thing. Our our uh, batch at 15558. He's gone so that he is now perpendicular, so he can fire directly west and have shots to hit the 183. And again, what well, you're going to be really careful just just spot hits the 183. So I figured he'd backed up, and. One of my teammates is going to criticize me for what I'm about to do here, which is to just to take a snapshot. And you could argue uh, that that was, you know, unnecessary. Uh, it was a risk, but you know, because he's been spotted, um, my uh, friendly, my platoon mate came up and just crushed him, you know, with that hash, which is just so brutally effective. And then now, really, we're holding all the keys. I can't be one shot by the gorilla, and all the 183 needs to do is keep pressing W until he spots either uh, the gorilla or the arty. But remember, the reason why we were able to come back from this battle, despite losing the 1-2 lane, was the fact that we never lost mid-control. I didn't over-retreat, right? And there's a huge tendency for players to do that, instead of recognizing when there's reasonable, a reasonable degree of safety and certainly high value. I, I really um, helped uh, several of their tanks get wrecked when they tried to push up. Their 183, and especially their T-62A, just got obliterated when they tried to push north along you know, the 8 lane. And then eventually I was able to push over to the western ridge and primarily work my gun a little bit, just primarily be there to spot, right? And so what's interesting about, I, I, won't, I won't tell you that the Udez 1516 uh, is overpowered. It's not. It's not fast enough to be overpowered and it doesn't have uh, the, the kind of armor and gun depression that allows it to be totally flexible. But you can see you can play it with these two different modes. I think it's a terrifically balanced tank and it brings a lot of uh, flavor and differentiation to the game. And so for that reason, you know, I think Wargaming did a good job in uh, adding to the game. I hope you enjoyed this video. Let me know if you want to see the uh, Tier 9 reviewed next. Take care.